Today, on the first Sunday after Christmas, and on Christmas morning, twice this week, if you go to a service on the morning of December 25th, we read the prologue of John. And each of the four evangelists, the four gospel writers, open their accounts of Jesus' life with their main point, the lens through which they want you to read the rest of their gospel. So Mark's gospel opens, you may remember, very quickly with the baptism of Jesus. And the Holy Spirit descends upon him and the Father says, this is my beloved son. And then Jesus immediately goes out into the wilderness. He battles Satan and he comes back and he starts healing people. And even more than that, casting out demons. So Mark's main point, God has come to do battle with Satan and to bring his kingdom here. Matthew and Luke are pretty different. They open with genealogies that we tend to glaze over, but they're really important genealogies. What are they saying? Well, Matthew is saying, this man, Jesus, is a bona fide son of King David. He's the person we've been waiting for, right? And Luke's main point with his genealogy and his longer story about Jesus' infancy is this is history. We didn't just make this up. This isn't a nice story. This happened. Jesus' life took place in history. We have eyewitnesses. But John takes a whole different approach when he opens his gospel, right? He opens it with this beautiful, dense, rich, textured poem, a poem about the incarnation. And there's a lot there. But if you could boil John's point down simply, I think he'd be saying, the point is, God has come. God has come. Where? Here. Why? To bring light and life to you. Light and life fill this poem that we call the prologue. And light's a key theme throughout John's gospel. What does light do? It helps us to see clearly. It's like eyeglasses. When I was in the first grade, my teacher noticed that I could read. But any time I had to do anything, respond to a question that she wrote on the chalkboard, I just gave it my best guess. And a lot of times that was very wrong. This is a lot like you get an eye exam. If you've ever had an eye exam, what do they ask you? Read the smallest line that you can see. And I always feel like pressure. I need need to go one line down from what I can actually see. So I think A, G, I, is that an L? L, yeah, I'm confident, that's an L. And then they say one or two, and they switch the lens. Oh, I can see now, A-E-D-F, okay, right, that lens switch where you can suddenly see that is like the light of Christ that John is telling us about at Christmas. Now, one thing that light helps us to see is how God made the world and how we ought to live in it, and we call this the moral good, right versus wrong. We couldn't see very clearly without this light, and humanity guessed at what was right and wrong, the right way to live and the wrong way to live, and we often got it wrong. And it's not that humans didn't care about ethics. Read some of the great classicists. They wrote a lot about morality and ethics, but they got it wrong in places. But in Jesus, finally, we can see clearly because we're not exploring our own minds and our own hunches, but we get access into the very mind of God. It's like the baptismal hymn, I want to walk as a child of the light. I want to walk with Jesus. We get access. We get relationship with the maker of good, with the light himself. But I think we get this backwards sometimes, don't we? Even in the church, we think of the Christian life as kind of bland, kind of beige, kind of vanilla. And unfortunately, 
even in Christian circles, we communicate this, although I think we do it unwittingly. But I bet you've heard this. Have you ever been at a a retreat or heard a speaker say, you know, before my conversion, I lived a very colorful life, you know, back in my college years. Well, what do they mean about this colorful life? Well, they mean they made a lot of poor life decisions, right? Stereotypically, uh, um, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, right? That's kind of the, the vision we get of this colorful life. But is that really colorful? Well, what's color? It's the catching of light, right? And reflecting it back in beauty and vibrancy. It fills our life with wonder. Think of the sunset, oranges and purples and reds over the green emerald waters off Highway 98, right? Or think of a great feast set out, maybe on Christmas, with lots of foods, different colors, candlelight, colored napkins. Or think of art, like the great Sistine Chapel, that just overwhelms and surrounds you. Those colorful experiences don't represent the life Jesus is calling us out of. They represent the life Jesus is calling us into. Beautiful life. And that's why the Christian tradition has always thought of morality not as just true, but also as beautiful, as beautiful. The psalmist says, blessed are you, O Lord, teach me your statutes. I delight in your statutes. Learning right from wrong isn't just good, it's not just important, it's lovely, it's beautiful. It adds color to life because finally we get it, how it's all supposed to work, how it's all made to work. Now, we might call this living the good life, finally, right? And that's what we're all after, to live the good life. But the New Testament puts this a little more startlingly. It says that Christ did come to give us the good life, yes, but in that he came to save us from slavery to sin. The wages and ultimate outcome of which is death. Every time. Inevitably. So sin isn't the fun stuff that God deprives us of. It's the stuff that kills us. But Satan desperately wants to persuade us otherwise. He casts darkness where there's light to hide the reality behind evil, to make it look attractive, to make it seem colorful and exciting and worth flirting with. And he's the master of disguise. He's the master of manipulation. Paul tells us Satan masquerades as an angel of light. He pretends to be Jesus. He pretends to be the one who will help us to see the world clearly. Christopher West is this great Christian teacher who goes around giving talks, and he gives us a brilliant image for this idea of the world in darkness, the world that needs light. He says, it's as if the whole world is driving around in cars without any air in the tires. And of course, this ultimately damages our cars in all sorts of ways, but we've all forgotten that there's supposed to be air in the tires. And we just think that's normal. And in fact, it has become normal. And we would never think, it would never even occur to us to put air back in our tires. And if we wanted to, we wouldn't be able to. But it's the light of Christ that shows us we need air back in our tires, right? And so when when Christ comes into the world, he's like a beautiful Aston Martin. His tires pumped up 32 PSI, driving down Main Street. And we see his life and think, oh, that's what driving is supposed to look like. That's what a car is supposed to do. We never thought of that. But life and light is more than just not driving around with flat tires. It's more than just learning right from wrong. God doesn't want us to just stop sinning. The light of Christ does show us morality. But if God just wanted you to stop sinning, then you could just stand there, frozen, forever, not sinning. And that would be the good life, right? But it's not. It's not. 
That would be like an elevator taking you from the basement to the ground floor. Right? But God wants you to go higher and higher to the top to see the beautiful view. He came to heal us from sin and after that to glorify us, to bring us into his life and his beauty. Jesus says, I came that they would have life and have it abundantly, colorful life, joyful life, full life. So God didn't just come up with rules that we ought to follow. He says, no, listen, the cost of not following those rules is misery and anxiety and conflict and death. But I want you to live. I want you to live. So I'm giving you these rules that are a lot more like warning labels, right? You know the warning labels. Don't iron your clothes while you're wearing them. Don't stop the chainsaw with your hand. Don't make toast while you're in the bubble bath, right? And these are real labels. Don't do these things. I have some of these rules for my toddler. The biggest one is don't eat the peanut butter sandwich in one bite. And he's sure that that is trying to ruin his joy so that he lives a boring life eating peanut butter sandwiches one bite at a time. But that's not why I have the rule. I have the rule so he'll live because I want to live with him. Right? I want to tickle him and sing songs with him and pray with him and teach him to explore this beautiful world together. And that, St. John tells us, is what God is after at Christmas. He, did, he could have just given us a little light, right? And he did start to give us light from heaven in what we call the Old Testament, the Ten Commandments, what we sometimes think of as the rules. But those, and those are important rules. They're important to follow because without them, we lead to death. But he could have stopped there. Live by these rules. That's kind of the peak of the Christian life. But that's not what he's after. He's not after rule followers. He's after life and relationship. St. John tells us we are given the right to become children of God. I think we get a little too used to that language. That's a phenomenal claim. That's a startling claim. We're humans. God is divine. But he's after divinizing us, making us his children, glorifying us, giving us abundant life with him. And isn't that what our world is after? Abundant life, the good life. There's all these things that fill our world, medical technology to make life longer, entertainment to make life fun, cars and homes to make life comfortable, books and blogs and podcasts to make life interesting, volunteer opportunities to make life meaningful. And those are all good things, they're fine things. They do enhance our lives, but they don't give us the full abundant life that is only found as a child of God. We only get that if God comes to us with arms wide open. And today's reading says, Jesus has come to you with arms wide open. He wants life with you. So this light of Christ, it shows us the moral good, how to live, but it also shows us God himself. We've seen his glory, St. John writes today, and he gave us the power to become his children. And children, over time, get to know their father. They know his habits, they know his routines, they know his motivations, they know his heart, they know his mind. And that's what we're given at Christmas. Before Jesus, humanity knew a little bit about God. Right? We look at the Greeks and they show us this. They wrote a lot about God. Socrates reasoned that there was one God a good God, but he didn't know anything else about God. He couldn't through reason alone. But in the life of Jesus, we learn so much. We learn that God loves us, that he wants to save us from sin, that he's all powerful, all knowing, all good, that he wants to heal our wounds, physical, emotional, and spiritual, that he rejoices with us, that he suffers with us that he has a kingdom that will never end and that he invites us into. And we could go on and on, but the point is clear. 
All of these things are only made available to us. We only know them through the light of Christ at Christmas. We could never reason them. We could never just experience them on our own without Jesus. So to have the abundant life, to have the full truth, to have full beauty, you have to come to Jesus at Christmas. And then when we come to Jesus, when we come to God the Father, when we become his children, when we live in his family, more and more we start to resemble the Father. We become people who don't just choose good, but who love good because we love God and we love others. Those two commandments we open the liturgy with don't become commandments anymore. They become the natural way of living, the natural choice we make because we want to, because we love goodness and love God. And I imagine each of you know that and have experienced that. But if you don't know that, if you haven't experienced that transformation, or maybe you did, maybe you had a strong conversion years ago, you felt spiritually awake and alive, but you haven't really felt that way lately. The new year is a great time to reflect on that, right? We, we start this new year of the calendar, making New Year's resolutions, looking at goals, thinking about how we can make our life a little better in 2020. Well, wherever you are, but particularly if you, you're not feeling spiritually connected, spiritually healthy, spiritually awake, take some time over the next few days as you prepare for this new year. Think about those patterns of life that bring spiritual life, right? Prayer, daily prayer. Praying in the morning and at noon at lunchtime and at night before bed is, an, is a powerful and easy pattern of prayer that we can all step into. And you can do that with the prayers in our prayer book. You can do that with your own prayers. But it starts to shape your days. And the way you spend your days is the way you spend your life. Think about getting a spiritual director or another mature Christian who can disciple you. No one teaches themselves anything in this life. And you're not going to teach yourself to pray or to live the Christian life on your own. Even if you're a self-taught artist or plumber, some guy on YouTube or some Wikipedia article or some book actually taught you, right? We don't teach ourselves anything. Find someone the Christian life has lived in community. God talks about a family, right? It's not a philosophy that we can sit on our own and just kind of meditate on. It's a life lived out in community with other Christians and together with God in relationship. So think about that. If you have no one this year pouring into your life spiritually, meeting with you, praying with you, teaching you to go deeper, reflect on who God might be calling you to meet with. I find most times when someone comes to someone and says, will you disciple me? Even if they're busy, they say yes, because it's one of the joys of their busy life is to sit and share the Christian life with someone. And we're transformed by that, right? The converted heart is a changed heart. And that means when we're transformed, we become people capable of loving God and loving others like God loves them. We become bearers of this light in the world. The way we think, the way we speak, the way we parent, the way we work, the way we interact with strangers in public. Everywhere we go, we're like a floodlight in a dark world. And over time, the people we interact with see that light. It's like a switch going on in their life, and they start to see things more clearly. They start to see not just how to live their life properly, but the face of God. One of my dad's favorite things, because I wore glasses so young, He'd come in, and my glasses were always smudged, covered with dirt and dust all the time. And he'd plop them off my face, and he'd clean them, and he'd say, Son, as your father, my job is to help you to see the world more clearly. And he'd get a chuckle out of his dad joke. This was like every day of my childhood. <laughs> but guess what? In a way, cleaning my glasses a couple times a day did help me see the world more clearly. And it helped me see his face more clearly. 
right? And that's what the light of Christ at Christmas does. We see the world more clearly, and we see the face of God. And when others encounter you as a Christian in the world, everywhere you go, over time, that is the gift you have to give to them, to see the face of God. Precisely because that's the gift that God has given to you this Christmas. Amen.